Today, I'm beginning a series on the book of Jonah. Probably you most of you have heard that story, but we're going to look at some things that maybe will be a little new and different to you. Hopefully it's not too scary. <laughs> so turn with me in the book of Jonah. We're going to read the first chapter today. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? Where is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O oh Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared God, feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Dear God, I thank you for your word and what we learn from it. Help us learn today from the example in the life of Jonah. In Jesus' name, amen. Many years ago, probably more than I like to remember, was this cartoon about Jonah in the Far Side comic strip. It's Jonah returning to his house and meeting his wife at the front door. For crying out loud, Jonah, three days late, covered with slime and smelling like fish. And what story have I got to swallow this time? The first verse in the book of Jonah identifies the main character, although not necessarily the author, as Jonah, son of Amittai. The only other mention of Jonah is in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14, verse 24. During the 41-year reign of Jeroboam II, king of Israel, and that's the northern kingdom, 
So this suggests that the book of Jonah occurs, the events in the book of Jonah occur around 750 B.C. There was an earthquake in 760 B.C. In the, during the reign of Jeroboam II. And archaeologists have therefore synced up the physical evidence of the earthquake and the other records together. And we know that that happened in 760 B.C. And if Jonah was busy during Jeroboam's reign, then yeah, 750 B.C. plus or minus. So we know that Jonah was a prophet of God in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of Jeroboam II. This is after the kingdom was divided into the northern and the southern kingdoms. It was a period of prosperity and military success for the northern kingdom. Jeroboam had fought some battles and retaken land that he, the other kings before him had lost. And this was kind of the high point of the northern kingdom of Israel. But unfortunately, it was also a low point in that they were still steeped in idolatry. They are still worshiping idols. And only 50 years after the events of this, the northern kingdom would be completely destroyed by a series of invasions from the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was in what is now northern Syria and northern Iraq. Nineveh was one of the two main cities in the Assyrian Empire. And at the time of Jonah, it was the capital. The king of the Assyrian Empire was there. Nineveh was a very old city. It was founded by Nimrod, as is described in Genesis chapter 10. Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And it was located about where Mosul, Iraq, is now, along the Tigris River. And depending on the exact date of these events in the book of Jonah, the Assyrian Empire may have already started to overrun Israel. In 740 BC, the Assyrian Empire took the Transjordan tribes into captivity. In other words, the tribes on the east side of the Jordan River. And it's entirely possible that that had already happened and Jonah knew about that. Well, our narrative begins like many of the other prophetic books in the Old Testament. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. God gave a prophecy to Jonah about a city in a foreign nation, Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. But unlike only any other, uh, other prophets who God sent a message of judgment against one of the enemies of Israel, like Ezekiel and Amos and Obadiah and Nahum and Zephaniah, unlike any of those, God told Jonah, you go to Nineveh and deliver the message in person. You, Jonah, go to the wicked city of Nineveh in the Assyrian Empire, which is the enemy of your country, and go tell them they're dog meat. They're a wicked city and God has decided to destroy them. You go tell them that. Well, Jonah didn't like this job very much, so he went the opposite direction. Instead of going northeast to Nineveh over the trade route trails, he went southwest to Joppa and booked passage on a ship to Tarshish. The location of Tarshish is now unknown, but it was likely at the, what is now the southern tip of Spain at the Straits of Gibraltar, or possibly in North Africa and what is now Tunisia. There's also a case to be made for Sardinia, which is an island off of Italy, or even Great Britain. It's possible that Tarshish was Great Britain. It was certainly to the west, somewhere on the Mediterranean trade routes, and it was about as far away from Nineveh as Jonah could get. Well, Jonah figures, I'm scot-free now. I'm on my boat. I'm on my cruise. So he went below to sleep. 
great relief, you know, I don't have to take that job because I'm going the other direction. But God sent a storm onto the Mediterranean Sea. This storm was so bad, it terrified the sailors. They thought their ship was going to break up. And they started throwing their stuff overboard. That means real money. That means they're taking what they have bought to sell somewhere else and they're throwing it overboard to try to lighten the ship and save it. They had called on their gods and then they went to work to try to save themselves. Aren't we kind of like that most of the time? (laughs) We call upon God and then we work to save ourselves. You know, compare this with Acts chapter 27 verses 18 and 19. Paul is on his way to Rome to be tried before Caesar. And he's on a ship. The ship captain wanted to go before winter fell. Paul told him, no, you need to stay in port because it's going to be a bad winter. But because the ship captain was in a hurry, they went anyway. And you know what happened? A storm came up. And the ship started to break apart. And the sailors in Paul's ship did the exact same thing. They started throwing stuff overboard. Well, eventually the captain of Jonah's ship finally came down and woke him up and said, you need to wake up. We're in trouble. Call on your God. Maybe he will rescue us. Our gods don't seem to be doing anything, so maybe you should try calling on your God. And eventually the sailors recognized from their experience that this was not a natural storm. This was a supernatural storm. They concluded that it was directed at them, at their ship, because of something that somebody had done. And they decided to draw lots to see who was at fault. Drawing lots to answer a question like this was a common thing in antiquity. And it's often mentioned in the Bible. For instance, in Joshua chapter 7, they draw lots to see who had sinned when they had taken Jericho. And they they cast the lot in the tribe, and then they cast the lot on the clan, and and then they worked it down to this man named Achan by drawing straws and figuring out. Kind of the idea is that this is an opportunity for God to make a decision for us, but through chance. Well... What do you know? Jonah drew the short straw. He was the one picked. So he spilled his guts. He said, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. That's actually a pretty astonishing claim to make, because in that time, every little tribe had their own local God, who was only responsible for their little bit of land. Jonah is claiming that his God made everything and is responsible for everything. If the sailors were scared before, they are really scared now. But to their humanitarian credit, they were unwilling to throw him overboard, even though he said, that's what you need to do. They tried to row back to land first, but it didn't work. In fact, the storm got worse as they tried to row back to land. This tells us that they were only a short way out of Joppa, and they were trying to get back, but they couldn't. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't go back. They were trapped in this storm. And finally, they reluctantly tossed Jonah overboard, or maybe not so reluctantly. I don't know. But they threw him overboard with a prayer. Oh, Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, oh, Lord, have done as you pleased. This is your deal. This is your guy. And we're just doing the best we can. And at that very moment, the storm ceased. It was like flipping a switch. One second... The ship is going up and down and rolling and maybe almost capsizing. The next thing is perfectly calm. The sun comes out, blue sky. These sailors were really impressed by the power of the Lord of the Hebrews. They offered a sacrifice to him and they made vows. 
their lives had been changed by what they had experienced. Meanwhile, Jonah sank to his doom. Next week, we'll read what he was thinking on his way down. But even then, God showed his mercy to Jonah. He sent a great fish. That's the Hebrew word dog. It rhymes with our word for dog, but it refers to fish. It's used about 20 times in the Old Testament, and it's always translated as fish to swallow Jonah. Most recent artwork portrays this animal as a whale. But most whales don't have a throat big enough to swallow a man. One whale that does, incidentally and interestingly, is the sperm whale. And there are still present sperm whales in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. So sperm whale is a candidate. But there are also a number of fish, real fish, with scales that are large enough to swallow a man, including things like a whale shark and even really a big grouper could swallow you too. There's even catfish in some rivers in South America that are big enough to swallow a person. We don't know what exactly swallowed Jonah. Like many of the other biological terms in the Bible, we don't know how they should be properly translated. Fish is as good as any, and that's the way it's translated elsewhere in the Old Testament. So what do we learn from this first chapter of the book of Jonah? First, I think we're reminded that although the Old Testament is mostly an account of God working among the descendants of Abraham, the Jews, from which line the Messiah would come. There are also hints here and there in the Bible that God was at work with Gentiles, foreign nations, people who were not descended from Abraham. Along with Melchizedek, who is the priest of God Most High, who met Abraham, and Jethro, who's also priest of God Most High, and Moses' father-in-law, God's concern for the city of Nineveh illustrates that he was working among the Gentiles even then. The response of these sailors to this event is another illustration of God working in the lives of Gentiles, even in the Old Testament. Secondly, we learn that there are consequences for disobeying God. And sometimes those consequences affect other people. These sailors were affected by Jonah's decision to flee from God. They were not being punished for their own sin at this moment, but they were being punished because they happened to take Jonah on their ship, and he was the one that God was after. And thirdly, we learn that God is merciful, even in the midst of our consequences. God would have been completely justified in letting Jonah drown. There are other occasions in the Old Testament, such as 1 Kings chapter 13, when a prophet disobeyed God and he was killed for it. I know of at least two of those. So God would have been completely justified in just letting Jonah drown in the water. That would have been the end of Jonah's story. And God would just have found somebody else to do what he needed to do. We also see that God is merciful to these sailors because they suffered a calamity. They lost money from throwing stuff overboard. But they got to have an encounter, a meeting with the God of the Hebrews through it in his mercy. And... As long as we live, we are never beyond repentance and we are never beyond God's mercy. And we will see how that plays out in Jonah's life in the weeks to come.